Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well and I wanted to start today's lecture off by really going over what we've talked about so far in class up to this point because this week is kind of halfway through the semester already. That's hard to believe but it's the case and we're going to be shifting gears here soon in the upcoming lectures. So I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page and that we can look back and kind of take a bird's eye view of where we've been, what we've talked about, and look at where we're going after this. Before I do that though, I do want to remind everyone that your review assignment is due this week. There should be a link to submit it in this week's module, which will be unlocked shortly, like when I'm done recording this vid video. Uh, so make sure you get that turned in. I'll get those back to you soon. And as always, if you have any questions on those, uh, be sure to get a hold of me, email me, ask me. For the, mo for the most part, uh, everybody's summary assignments were really good. I enjoyed reading those, and I'm looking forward to reading the reviews as well. So we s started off the semester by talking about the idea of critical reading as a whole what it is and how it's distinguished from regular reading or passive reading. Critical reading, um, also known as active reading or close reading, is really engaging with the text as opposed to just skimming it or reading it quickly. It's pulling apart the author's arguments, having conversation with the author. And the first step of critical reading, which we talked about near the beginning, was pre-reading and all of the techniques that go into that. We covered some of these techniques in detail. Uh, one would have been reading summaries on the backs of the book covers, reading reviews of the books that we'll find in bookstores or online, just really getting a sense of what it's about before you even go into it so you have that sense of direction and what you're going to be encountering in the book, whatever it is that you're reading. Uh, we also talked about blurbs, another thing that you'll see on covers sometimes, uh, quotes from other famous writers or other news publications touting how great the book is and what you're going to find in it. And then we covered uh, how to navigate a book's table of contents, how to find the main ideas in certain chapters or even in the book as a whole. Usually the thesis is stated near the beginning or summarized at the end, and then you can look around within that framework for the more specific details of the text that you're needing for whatever research you're doing doing that requires you to read that book. And after we talked about all these pre-reading techniques, we moved on to talking about critical reading, and we discussed some of the things that we would do as critical readers, one of them being, being able to summarize the essay. And we do this not just to uh, prove that we've read it and we know what we're talking about, but also, also to show that we can restate what the essay is saying in our own words. That's how you know that you've really uh, assimilated the information that you've picked up. Uh, you're not just parroting back phrases of the authors. You're, you've internalized what the author is saying and you can express it uh, in your own mode, through your own thoughts. That's how you know that you've really kind of mastered what the text is talking about. Outlining is another good way of doing this, again allowing you to see a sort of skeletal framework of the work as a whole or the, a bird's eye view of what a book is about. Probably a book in this case because we're talking about longer works. And uh, we've also discussed what to do when we come across specialized terms, whether an author is using a word that's a common word, but they're using it in an uncommon way, or even if it's just a word that you might not be familiar with, what to do when you encounter those words. Don't just skim over them, but don't feel that you have to put down the book and go look up every word on Google either. Use context clues. Uh, try to figure out what the word means from the other words in the sentence that you find it in. It's more of an active exercise, hence a critical reading technique. And the final critical reading technique I want to talk about today is that of go approaching a work with a suspension of your own personal beliefs. And we're going to talk about that in more detail in a minute. Uh, next week, uh, since we've really covered pre-reading techniques and criti critical reading techniques, we're going to be we're going to start looking at the different genres of 
literature that you are likely to encounter, not just in school, but you know, all throughout your life. And we'll spend a couple weeks talking about those different genres. So that's what's going to be happening in the future. So, uh, suspension of beliefs. I think I've mentioned before, maybe in one of our first lectures when I was talking about annotating, that I tend to engage with texts that I disagree with or that I don't like more than with texts that I really like. If I'm reading a novel, for example, and I really like it, I'm absorbed in it. I'm not really stopping to think sometimes about what the author's saying or what the implications are of the themes or the morals that they're trying to convey in that novel. I'm swept away by the story itself. And it's enjoyable, but at the same time, it's not really a critical reading of that novel. However, if I pick up a novel and I really don't like it, maybe I think that the author has a bad worldview, or the characters aren't very well defined, maybe the words that the author uses just aren't very captivating, it's kind of a dull read, then my brain starts being a little bit more active in terms of digesting what I'm reading. It's not swept away. Um, it's pausing and saying, hang on, why am I reading this? What's this author saying? And I start being more critical. I start picking apart the elements of the book that I don't like. Maybe there's a specific scene or a specific uh, thing that the author does that annoys me. Stephen King talked about that in his essay, how the one author used the word zestful all the time, and it drove him crazy. He says, I've never used the word zestful in any of my books that I've written because this one author just said it over and over again, and it ruined the word for me, basically. So... When we're approaching a book that we don't like, or an essay that we don't like, or even one that we disagree with, uh, we're more likely to be critical of it. We're also more likely to engage it. So we're going to have more of a conversation with that text. You, if you're taking annotations or writing notes in the margins, you might be raising objections to what the author's saying. And all these are good things, right? It's a part of critical reading. Uh, but you also, at the same time, want to make sure that you're not so hostile to what the author is saying that you cut yourself off from them completely. Because you could it's possible to approach a text and be so against it from the start that the author might make a good point somewhere down the line that you missed because you were just uh, nitpicking and looking for flaws and not really giving the author a fair chance to begin with. Now, this can happen with uh, works of fiction. Uh, if you've heard bad things about a particular a particular author, or I don't know if it's a genre that you're not very appreciative of, appreciative of, and I mean we could probably all think of examples. I know that you know, like my mom used to like to read the really cheap paperback romance novels, right? Uh, they're all the Harlequin novels. They all have the covers with the picture of the couple. Stand, standing on a beach or standing in a field and they're gazing into each other's eyes or kissing or something like that. And, you know, it's easy to mock those sort of novels if you don't enjoy reading them yourself because, as I've pointed out to my mom before in the past, you already know what's going to happen in them. There's a formula. Uh, it's the same plot every time. A couple meets, uh, they fall in love, some sort of barrier to their happiness arises and is overcome and they live happily ever after. So you can approach one of those novels already kind of knowing what it's going to be about and not really being open to enjoying it if you're not a fan of romance novels. Maybe you like horror novels or fantasy novels. You're not likely to really give that Harlequin book a fair shot. But the same thing can be true with nonfiction essays as well. Uh, if you're reading an author, maybe you're, you ha you're being told to read an author uh, for another class, or uh, maybe a friend's really recommended an author to you that you've heard things about them before, you've heard what they've talked about, and you don't really think that you're going to like it, but you still want to be able to be open to what they're saying. And that doesn't mean that you have to change your mind or agree with what they're saying. In fact, the opposite can happen, and it's good for you. Uh, this, is, this is the suspension of beliefs. So you're approaching a text, and maybe you read the author's 
thesis statement in that opening paragraph and you go, oh, wow, you know, I, uh, I'm going to disagree with this quite a bit. But then uh, because you think that, you're not really following along with the author's argument. You're just saying, no, I don't agree with that. I think that's wrong. This essay's stupid, blah, 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 blah. And you can just go on in that manner and finish the essay and put it aside and say, well, I didn't get anything from that. But um, the wiser thing to do, and I think the thing that is more tied up with critical reading, is to follow along with that author's argument or thesis, even if you don't necessarily agree with it or if you think it's wrong, because being able to follow their train of logic uh, will help you to solidify your own thoughts on the subject or your own objections. It's why whenever you're writing an argumentative essay, and you'll probably have to do this in English 101 or in English 102, they always suggest presenting a counter argument. And it's not just for fun. Uh, it's not just to present the other side of the argument because it's good sport. It's because it shows that you, as the author of that essay, or as the person who's making the argument, has considered the objections, and having considered them, still hold to the same position that you did from the beginning. It boosts up your credibility, in other words. You're not just somebody who hasn't thought things through and who's sticking to your one idea through thick and thin. You've seen the objections, you've seen the opposing side, and you have a fair answer to that. You can uh, shut down the objections and the arguments against your argument, but only because you actually understand what those objections are. Uh, you can restate them in your own words. It's not a matter of uh, dumbing down the opposite side of the argument or uh, maybe even sometimes vilifying the other side of the argument. You actually know what they're talking about, and because of that, you can give the appropriate counter. This is all stuff, again, that you're probably going to talk about in English 101 and in, and in English 102, and it's why I want to bring it up here. But this all has to do with uh, being able to suspend your own beliefs and your own thoughts when you're approaching a text that you uh, don't think you're going to like or that you don't think you're going to agree with. A good example of this, uh, maybe, is one of the essays that was assigned for you to read this week, uh, The Ways We Lie, by Stephanie Erickson. Um, this is one of the more popular essays, I think, in this anthology. A bunch of students previously, when I've taught this class, really liked working with this one. And it's interesting because uh, initially, my first thoughts upon reading it were, wow, this is kind of a controversial essay, because when we think about lying, we think that lying is something that's wrong. You know, we try not to lie. It's been drilled, in our, drilled into our heads since kindergarten, right? Don't tell a lie, tell the truth. But this essay starts out um, by making a claim that not necessarily I thought controversial, but I thought maybe other people would find controversial. She says, we lie. We all do. We exaggerate, we minimize, we avoid confrontation, we spare people's feelings, we conveniently forget, we keep secrets, we justify lying to the big guy institutions. Like most people, I indulge in small falsehoods and still think of myself as an honest per person. Sure, I lie, but it doesn't hurt anything. Or does it? So she begins her essay by making the statement that we all lie. Um, if you say that you don't lie, you're a liar. <laughs> so um, it's the sort of inescapable thing. And that could rub somebody the wrong way, I think, in casual conversation. If you call them a liar and say, hey, um, we're all liars. It's inescapable. But then um, the essay goes on to kind of define what she means by lying. Uh, she says that there's not just one type of lie. There's other things that we might not normally consider lies but that she would classify as a subcategory under the umbrella category of lying. The white lie, we've, ar we've always heard of that. Um, we tell it because we assume that the truth will cause more damage than a simple, harmless untruth. There's ignoring the plain facts. There's deflecting and omission. Uh, she, tells a whole she gives us a whole lot of different uh, types of lying.
some of them we might not have even thought of as being lies. And she wraps up by making the point that it's not easy to entirely eliminate lies from our lives. No matter how pious we may try to be, we will still embellish, hedge, and omit to lubricate the daily machinery of living. But there is a world of difference between telling functional lies and living a lie. Uh, Martin Huber once said, The lie is the spirit committing tre treason against itself. Our acceptance of lies becomes a cultural cancer that eventually shrouds and reorders reality until moral garbage becomes as invisible to us as water is to a fish. So her argument's taken on a turn that really the beginning of the essay didn't seem like it would take. The beginning of the essay was stressing this fact that we all lie, and maybe if you read that and you disagreed with it right off the bat and you didn't want to hear her out, you would walk away from the essay thinking that her point is that it's okay to lie because we all do it. Um, it's harmless. But that's not really the point that she's making, and we read that in the closing passages, uh, a, passage, a part of which I've just read to you. Uh, she says that if we allow ourselves to tell all of these smaller lies that we might not normally consider to be lying, that's going to sort of null us or numb us to the, to the bigger lies when somebody tells them to us. Uh, when do we stop accepting that the real truth is in the fine print? Whose lips do we read this year when we vote for president? When will we stop being so reticent about making judgments? Uh, she says, maybe if I don't tell the bank the checks in the mail, I'll be less tolerant of the lies told me every day. So she's saying that everybody does tell lies, and it's something that you know we do naturally. Uh, sometimes we justify them. But there's a danger to it because when we tell lies, we're opening our, ourselves up to lies being told to us. So it's a more complicated and nuanced argument than that initial um, opening paragraph would lead us to believe. But again, we somebody who didn't really give that essay a fair shot wouldn't know that because they wouldn't have read through the whole thing. And it's really a great essay. So when you approach an essay, always be willing to give the author their fair say, um, hear them out, suspend your own beliefs, approach it, willing to uh, follow along with what the author's saying, and then, you know, maybe you've read something bad and it really is trash, whatever it is. Um, by the time you get to the end of the essay, you'll know that for sure, and then you can make an informed objection to it in the future. So, um... That is the final sort of hint that I have, not hint, but sort of advice that I would have for critical reading. And we'll talk more about critical reading in upcoming lectures when we start looking at the different genres. But uh, yeah, that's all that I really have to say for this week's lecture. Um, be sure to get a hold of me if you have any questions, and I will see everyone next time. Thanks.